Now for our scripture reading. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink from one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word from 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, the 12th through the 20th verses. If you have your Bible, open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to be looking around there. We've already read the scripture, um, but we're going to be referencing that. So you want to have it open in front of you. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Imagine walking into a room with body parts scattered everywhere. You got the image? Now you might think that you've just entered into the basement of some serial killer or something, right? You're like, what is going on? Well, you wouldn't think that if you lived in ancient Corinth, the community that this letter is addressed to. If you walked into a room full of body parts, you would immediately think, I'm in a temple. Let me explain. You see, archaeologists have unearthed a huge number of terracotta body parts, and these are some on display in modern-day Corinth in a museum. And these body parts were found in the temple of the Greek god Asclepius. And see, the Greek god Asclepius is one that you may not think you're familiar with, but have you ever seen the medical symbol of a staff and a snake twirled around? That is the Greek god Asclepius's staff. Why? Because the Greek god Asclepius was the god of healing and the god of health. Now, the origin of that symbol is disputed because, of course, we have the Old Testament image, right, of Moses lifting up the staff, which predates the Greek myth. But the people would bring these terracotta body parts. If you had a hand issue, you would bring a hand. If you had a stomach issue, you would bring a stomach. If you had a, an ear issue, you would bring what? Yeah, that's right. And if you had a foot issue, you would bring what? A foot, right? And you would literally bring a foot or an ear or a hand before the god Asclepius so that the god would bless you and heal you. Okay, this was part of their religion. People would literally bring body parts as objects of worship. I want to submit to you that today in the church, we too have become a room of scattered body parts. Uh, that, that in the church today, we too have become a room of scattered body parts, Christians living in isolation from one another, living separate lives, defining Christianity as 
a solely individual religion. It's just about me and Jesus. All right? It's, it's, it's about me and my personal private religion. And we've bought the lie. And, we, and we're like the Greeks. We've created a room full of isolated body parts. But God gave the church His Spirit. And He gave the church gifts that we've been talking about in this series. He gave the church gifts to work against this division. To work against this scattered body part religion that we're all part of. And so as we approach the Scripture today, God is going to show us three different ways that the, that the Spirit and the gifts are pushing back against that division. And, and, and the first way that the gifts operate here is to strengthen the unity of the church. The first way is to strengthen the unity of the church. Look with me again at verse 12. You got it? In your Scripture, open it up and look at it with me. Verse 12. For just as the body is one... And has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of how many spirits? One spirit. We were all made to drink of one spirit. You see, Corinth, ancient Corinth, was like the New York City of its day. Okay, imagine a metropolitan community in the ancient world. Corinth was located on an isthmus, which you may know is is a narrow strip of land connecting a peninsula with the mainland of Greece. You can see that in the image above, how how strategic this location was uh, for commerce and for trade and for the expansion of culture, Greek and Roman culture, around the world. The trade not only moved north and south, but it moved east and west because the Isthmus of Corinth connected the Aegean Sea on the east and the Adriatic Sea on the west. And so this community, this Greco-Roman community that Paul is writing to, this church, they lived in a multicultural, religiously diverse, multi-ethnic, socioeconomically ethnic community and world. That is the world that they lived in. That is the world that this message about the unity that the Spirit gives the church is coming into. And as you know, because we all live in 21st century America, social divisions in the culture threaten the unity where? In the church. Cultural divisions out there threaten the unity of the church. And so God calls his people to a radical unity. God calls his people to a radical spiritual, which means in the spirit, oneness. A radical oneness. For the scripture says, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. And isn't this an amazing metaphor, the body? I've given you a little insight into why Paul may have chosen this image because of the cult of Asclepius that was, you know, in their modern day. But the body becomes this metaphor to describe the church. Because a human body is one, right? You only have one body, but you have many members. Not members like club members, but members like what? Come on, church body parts, right? We have many, that's what member means. We have the word dismember, which means you lose one of your body parts. So the the Bible word member and the church word member just means body parts. And if you've ever taken our intro class, our new members class, you know I harp on this. It's body parts is what a member really is. And so the scripture here says that there's one spirit and we're baptized into one body. When the, when the waters of baptism are poured out, it represents the, the filling of the spirit. That image of the water pouring out and cleansing you like, like, a, like a fresh rain or a shower is to represent the spirit's filling. And all believers have the same spirit. There's not a spirit for you and a spirit for you. There's one spirit. 
And it's in the Spirit that the Scripture tells us that we have unity that transcends human divisions. Notice what the Scripture says here, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, he, he addresses the, 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 the racial and the ethnic differences. He addresses the economic and the cultural and the social differences in these, in these phrases. And he's saying that in Christ, in the Spirit, that social, economic, cultural, gender, ethnic dividing lines disappear. In the one Spirit. All of these lines disappear when it comes to faith in Christ. So that when the gifts of the Spirit are operating in the church, when your gift is operating and my gift is operating and your gift is operating in the church, it strengthens the unity of the church. Because we don't just rely on a person who's very talented. We don't just rely on that one person who's really good at hospitality or really good at teaching are really good at serving. Why? Because the gifts of the one Spirit showcase our unity. Because they all are needed. All of the gifts are needed to showcase the oneness of Christ's body. The American church, like the Corinthian church, is divided. In so many ways, divided by faith. There's a book of that title by Christian Smith and Michael Emerson, where they talk about the American church as existing within a racialized society. That means race matters in this country and in this community. It matters because it allocates different economic, political, social, and even psychological rewards to groups along racial lines. I'll read it again. A racialized society is one that allocates different economic, political, social, and even psychological rewards along racial lines. That is the, that's the soup that we swim in, right? That's the, the culture that we live in, and these lines are socially constructed. They're, they're what Paul's talking about when he says Jew or Gentile, slave or free. See, their country had the same kinds of things that we do. Every culture struggles with these kinds of divisions rooted in human sinfulness. Sinfulness that's baked in to our societal structures. And that because of carelessness and neglect, it gets baked into the church too. In American society, this racialized society involved slavery, race-based slavery. It involved segregation. It involved mass incarceration. It involved economic and social disadvantage for people of color. We still experience this today. In some ways, it's even more in your face today. And this reality has led to misunderstandings, it's led to discord, and it's led to distrust about which the church does not experience the unity that God has designed for the church, right? We don't experience the unity that we should because of these external and sometimes internal pressures. And so, God wants us to recognize the Spirit's work among us. And and this is a way forward. It's a way to strengthen the unity of the church by recognizing the different gifts. It works to undo the divisions. Why? Because it places the emphasis not on who you are, what your culture is all about. It, it, It removes the emphasis on us and places it where? On the Spirit of God. It places the emphasis on what God is doing. Not our human priorities. Not our human proclivities. But on God. And the church uh, in this 
in this way, God wants to show the world a different way. We've been talking about the light a lot today. It's come up in our songs and in our scripture. God wants his people to be a light that shines before all men. A light that reveals not a scattered room of body parts, but one body. One body working together in unison for one purpose and one vision. You know, today it's becoming more popular to speak of unity. It's becoming more popular to speak of even reconciliation, unity, togetherness. Let's all just hold hands. Man, Orangeburg loves to get together and hold hands. But let me tell you that when you see me or uh, Mr. Gary or uh, one of the ladies holding hands around the public square, it doesn't go very deep. Let's just be honest. It doesn't go very deep into how we live with one another, into our actual lives together. It's popular to speak of unity. It's popular to say all lives matter. But what this actually means, listen to this, what it actually means is not unity, but uniformity. Because what we're actually looking for is not to experience diversity in unity, but uniformity. We end up replacing a church of scattered body parts with a church of one big body part. But spiritual gifts push back against that. When we recognize and we utilize our spiritual gifts in the church, it strengthens the unity of the church and it doesn't lead us toward uniformity, but it affirms the diversity of the church. Look with me at verse 14. Verse 14 says, For the body does not consist of one member. Why are they thinking one member? Because they're all thinking, okay, unity. Right? He says, no, 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 listen. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. And then he breaks it down. He says, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. Would that make it any less a part of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye... I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? See, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Uniformity is when one quality is set up as ideal. Listen, uniformity is when one quality... One experience, one culture is set up as ideal. And all the other qualities, all the other gifts are downplayed and undervalued. Every church tradition has its problem with this. Some elevate the gift of teaching. Others, the gift of prophecy. Others, speaking in tongues. Others, mercy. And what this does is it, is it sets up one member as the body. It creates an imbalance. Imagine a body shaped like just one body part. <laughs> right? Imagine a body shaped like just one body part. It's, it's, it's a ridiculous image. And that's really what the Apostle Paul is going for here. He wants us to see that it's crazy. It's ridiculous. We would never think of the body like that. Or as only that. I was catching up with a friend this week who recently moved to a new city. And the last time that we talked, I had recommended a church to her. And I said, hey, you ought to check out this church. And so she went and she visited. And when we talked this week, I said, so how's it going? How's it going? Have you been going to the same church and all this and that. How's it going? She said, no. She said, I stopped, I stopped going. I, what, what gives? Why? What, what was happening? She said, well, they didn't really know what to do with a divorced woman. She said, everyone's the same, and I just don't fit in. 
Can you relate to that? This is a Bible-believing, gospel-of-Jesus-preaching church. I know it is. But like many, they have become captive to a vision of uniformity and not true unity in the Spirit. And we all struggle with that. This church struggles with that. We'll always struggle with that. As long as I'm the pastor, as long as you're here, we're all going to struggle with this. But God wants you to know, brothers and sisters, boys and girls, God wants you to know that you belong here. That you belong in the church. Verse 15 says this, If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not, what? Belong here. Because I'm not a good speaker, I don't belong here. Because I'm not a good singer, I don't belong here. Because I... Because I'm poor, I don't belong here. Because I'm super rich, I don't belong here. Because I have these gifts or that gift, I don't belong here. And God is saying to us, no, no, no. It's not that you don't belong. It's that you do belong. It's that we've emphasized the wrong thing. We've not affirmed the diversity of the church. But the Spirit of God does. And that's what the gifts serve to strengthen and to affirm that, 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 it, that we need different kinds of people. That we need all kinds of backgrounds. That we need all kinds of gifts. That this diversity must be pursued and it must be intentionally valued. Or else, one dominant group will dominate by default. Whatever the dominant gifting is will dominate by its nature. And so we have to be intentional. We all have to think and pray about what our gifts are and find ways to plug into that. Go back and revisit last week's sermon if you want some ideas and thoughts about that. We need to always push back against the entropy of cultural and gift uniformity and find ways to empower and strengthen one another and use one another's gifts for the glory of God. An author that I read is Christina Cleveland and in her book, Disunity in Christ, she wrote this. When we meet Jesus around people who are just like us and then continue to follow Jesus with people who are just like us, We stifle our growth in Christ and open ourselves up to a world of division. However, when we're rubbing elbows in Christian fellowship with people who are different from us, we can learn from each other and grow more like Christ, like iron sharpens iron. Spiritual gifts strengthen the unity of the church. They, they, they affirm the diversity of the church. And lastly, they display the beauty of the church. Let's look at verse 18, if you have it with you, or look on the screen. Before I read this, I want to give you a definition of beauty, okay, because I want you to think about it. What is beauty in the eye of the beholder, right? Well, th- here's the dictionary definition. Beauty is a combination of qualities such as shape, color, or form that pleases the senses, especially the sight. Let me read that again. A combination of qualities such as shape, color, or form that pleases the senses, especially the sight. Now, verse 18. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. God arranged the members of the body. Beauty is not found in the individual parts, but in the arrangement. Think about a flower arrangement. 
right? Beauty is found in the right combination of, of shape and, and, and color and form. See, God is creating, uh, arranging His people with your gifts, your gifts and your gifts and your gifts to make something beautiful. He's arranging it that way. He's putting it in place. And, and, and who is the one arranging it? It's God, right? He's the, he, he's the artist. He's the one who gets the glory when we operate in the Spirit, when we operate in our gifting, when we serve the common good one for another. He arranges people of every culture and ethnicity, strengths and weaknesses, gifts and talents, life experience and inexperience, making His people beautiful together. Making His people beautiful together. And look, this is not what America wants. America wants a sexy preacher to stand up in front of the people. And this whole camera thing is fueling that right now. And so we have to work extra hard to make it not about the camera and the person. Especially here, because we're not working with much up here, all right? We have to use our gifts even more so now than ever because God is arranging everything for His, for His purpose. It's about Him. It's about what He's doing. You know, God has always done this. From the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1, God arranged the stars in the sky. It's the same word. He arranged the stars in the sky. And then, and then God, God set the man and the woman into the garden to keep it, to work it. See, God, God put you right where you are in your career. God put you right where you are in your disappointing life at times in order to do His will. Right where you are. He arranged it. He put you there. And in Genesis chapter 3, the scripture says that God arranged enmity. God arranged enmity between who? Between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. The same word. He arranged enmity. See, God has been arranging not just life and creation and beauty, but he's been arranging our salvation from the very beginning. From the very beginning, it's called the Proto-Evangelium. It means the first gospel word. Genesis 3.15, you've heard it before. The beauty of redemption. As we say at Christmas, goodwill toward men. That Jesus, the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, would come and be made flesh. That He would dwell among us. That He would live in a situation of poverty. That he would live in a situation of oppression that goes beyond anything we've ever known. And that in his life, he would be righteous. He would live a godly and loving life. So that all who trust in him, all who put their faith in him, would get the credit that his life bought us. And at the point that he was betrayed and at the point that he was put on a Roman cross and crucified, that the Lord, his Father, would look upon him, turn his face away. That in his body on the cross, Jesus would take our sin and pay the penalty of it. Not just for then, but forever. So that in his perfect life and in his perfect death and then in his victory, he truly would overcome sin and death. So that all who believe in him could be given his one spirit and that we could be filled with his presence. And so that this redemption that is beautiful could go out from here and it could go on into eternity that the kingdom of God is at hand. It's here today and we get to live in it. We get to live in it today. We get to experience it and express it in our gifts. We get to see what is God going to do? How is God going to arrange all of the parts that God is going to do right now 
in this world. The body is beautiful. The body is beautiful when the church is united in one spirit. When the church is resting in the finished work of Jesus. When the body is diversified with its many gifts. Working together for the common good and the glory of God. Then the world will see the beauty of God's kingdom. And y'all, they need to see it. We need to see it, don't we? But the world needs to see what the church means. One body, many parts, one glory, God's beautiful plan. Let's pray together. Lord, would you fill New City Fellowship with your spirit. Lord, would you strengthen us. Strengthen us to display a unity that the world longs for. And to affirm all of the diverse gifts and talents and experiences that you have arranged right here in this group, in this church, so that Orangeburg might know your redemption and experience it through your body. We love you, Lord. We need your strength. We need your help. Empower your people by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.